Hey guys, this is Adam with Adam Tech, and this week we're going to be looking at the Pow Kitty Q90. Alright guys, so let's go ahead and start checking out the box. On the front, you just have a picture of the Pow Kitty Q90. On this side, it just shows you what buttons you have. This, this device does not have dual shoulder buttons, but trust me, you're not going to need it for anything that this system plays. You have a nice volume wheel, you have your menu key for your emulators, D-pad, you have your analog slider, and your four buttons. SD card slot and headphone jack. On the bottom, there's nothing. Here, it just shows that it supports a 64-bit OS and everything that it supports here. It does support a lot more, and we'll get into that a little bit later. On here, it shows what comes in the console. So obviously, you get your console, USB cable, and user manual. It says wipe, it's actually clear. Same thing on this side. And really nothing else but just some Chinese writing. So. Let's go ahead and unbox this guy. All right, and in the box you have the actual console. Now this guy is kind of unique, along with the Pow Kitty uh, V90. There is a two-step uh, shutdown where you have to actually shut down software and then shut it down with the hardware button. I'll show you guys how to do this, uh, and this is true even when we do install the custom firmware later. So put that aside. All right. So I have what's assuming a quality control sticker. You have a USB Type-C cable. And you have, a looks like, a warranty card in Chinese. Yep. And you have a quick start manual. So, that's everything in the box. Let's go ahead and get to the actual device itself. All right, so. I'm not gonna lie, I really do like how the clear one looks. And those are rear facing speakers. You have your slider right here, your D-pad, your four button start select, that menu button for your emulators, and I really don't think this button does too much in the system. Your type C port, and again, your SD card slot, and your headphone jack. And I cannot emphasize to you that this slider is probably not gonna be used that much. It sort of feels like a PSP Go style slider. So we're gonna go ahead and check out the default software that comes on this guy. In a little bit, I'm gonna show you some custom software to install that's gonna definitely make this guy run a lot better, a little bit faster, and add more emulators to it. But let's go ahead and turn it on. Right. And that's the default software that comes on here, the NX Ho. All right. So it already took us to the power menu. So this is what I'm kind of talking about, is that to shut it down, you have to hit A here first, and then you can shut it down with the hardware button. But obviously we're not here for that, so let's go ahead and go to our games. So out of the box you have Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Famicom, Super Famicom, Game Gear, Master System. And we can go ahead and select our games from here. It does already come with a lot of ROMs on here. All right, so the sound in here isn't too bad. Again, it is coming from those rear speakers. You can hear a little better here. Not too distorted at all. The only thing with this one is, is that you don't get too many options on here where you can't really colorize it at all. All you have is show FPS and full screen scale, which is not what really anyone really wants. And of course, the reason why you don't have most of those options is because a lot of the emulators on here are actually about 10 years old. In fact, some of them are used on my PSP Go that we did earlier this month. You can see for this game the massive amount of slowdown. The custom firmware should help a little bit as it does introduce some auto frame skipping that, that does help a little bit. I know that people don't generally like auto frame skip, but I believe with auto frame skip for this game, it should work pretty well overall. So we're gonna go ahead and get out of here because it's not working. Like I said, again, these emulators are years old and have very little updates to them. But like I said, we're not gonna spend too much time on the software because we're gonna go ahead and install a custom version of the software. Hey, real quick, one thing I did forget to mention is that when we do the custom firmware, I do recommend that you get a brand new SD card as the SD card that does come with it is prone to failure. When you take it out, the new SD card is gonna look a little something like this. 
again, from everything I've read on the forums and everyone else, they say that typically the SD card fails in a couple months. So I recommend just getting a small one from Amazon or Micro Center. I'll go ahead and leave links down in the description. Uh, personally, I got a 32 gig from Micro Center for about four buck fifty, so that's what I'd recommend doing. All right, now I'll see you over at the computer. All right, guys. So before we go ahead and start with that custom firmware, uh, I would recommend taking the ROMs off of the uh, original SD card. Uh, for those who don't want to go searching around for their own ROMs, this is a good way of getting them. If you do already have your own ROM list, then you can go ahead and skip this step. But for those who want to take the ROMs off of here, go to Q90. Scroll down to ROMs, just take this, we're going to go ahead and copy them. And then on our desktop, we're going to create a new folder. For right now, let's just go ahead and call it PowKitty. And then make a new ROMs folder. And put everything in here. All right, now this is going to take a minute because it is 12 gigs. So I will go ahead and pause and come back when it's done transferring. All right, guys, we are back. Everything has transferred over. So let's go ahead and try to download our new custom software. So I did go ahead and post the link in the description. If you click on that, it'll take you to this GitHub. All you're going to do is scroll down until you see setup. Go ahead and, and hit click to access. And then once you do, we're going to go ahead and scroll to which device we have. Obviously, we have the Pow Kitty Q90 V90. Let's go ahead and hit English Guide. Uh, th this video is actually taken down, so don't even click on it. Uh, here's a picture step by step on what to do, but we're going to go ahead and show you. So go ahead and download this custom image, download Partition Vision, download the Win Disk 32 Manager. You don't have to download 7-Zip. If you already have WinRAR, it does the same thing. You're all good to go. And I do recommend installing this SD card formatter just because it helps format the SD card a little bit better than uh, Partition Wizard does. So once you go ahead and download all those things, we're going to go ahead and go to our download folder. Let's go to downloads. And these four files should be here for you. So let's just go ahead and highlight them all. We're going to copy them and then we are going to put them in our desktop file right here. All right, we'll wait for them to transfer over. Should be relatively quick. All right, so go ahead and install these two real quick. And after you do that, let's go ahead and unzip the custom software for it. All right, guys, so now that we've went ahead and plugged in our new SD card, let's go ahead and format it. So let's search for SD card formatter. All right, and then this is my SD card. Let's go ahead and relabel it to whatever you want to. I'm just going to call mine Pow Kitty for now. Hit OK. Exit on that. And the next thing we're going to do is now that's format FAT32, we're going to go ahead and install our uh, firmware image. So go ahead and search for Win32 Disk Imager. Let's make sure that whatever letter your SD card is, is go ahead and select it. Then we'll go ahead and hit the Explore. Go to desktop, PowKitty, PowKitty Q90 V90 custom firmware, hit open. You don't have to worry about any of this hash stuff or generating anything, just go ahead and hit write. It's going to say a warning message that you might corrupt the device, you're totally good. Go ahead and hit yes. This process is going to take about five minutes, so I'll go ahead and come back when it's done. All right guys, we are back. As you can see, it's been written successfully. So you can go ahead and exit this program. And if we go over to our computer right here, you'll see that you have two new uh, boot files on here. One is called boot, one is called main. So we're gonna go ahead and use that uh, disk partition tool and increase main to the maximum that we can get it to. Cause that's where all of our ROMs will be stored, all of our emulators, everything like that. So let's go ahead and open up our mini partition. Close out this ad because no one cares. All right, and it looks like right here. So as you can see, this is the 29.12 gigabyte SD card that, that that we got going on. So let's go ahead and hit on main. Right click, and we're gonna hit move slash resize. I'm not gonna do it to the complete 26.71, but I'm gonna do it to 25.5. Go ahead and hit OK. 
and hit apply. Alright, and this will probably take about 30-40 seconds. Okay guys, so mine took a little bit more than 30-40 seconds. I think it's because I have a USB 2.0 adapter for my micro SD card. But we're all good to go now. So let's go ahead and hit OK. We can go ahead and close out this program. Hit yes again. All right, let's go ahead and go to this PC. And as you can see now, our main is now expanded to 25.4 gigs, where before I think it was like 1.55 megabytes. So if you click in here, you can see all your emulators, all the system files, and we are gonna put our ROMs. So if you go ahead and put ROMs right here. So it's gonna list every single ROM that you can put in here. Now I'm not gonna have all these systems on here. I'm gonna delete a couple of them. All right guys, so I went ahead and deleted everything I want off of here. So let's go ahead and drag over our ROM files. So just go ahead and select all the folders that you want. And then once again, this is gonna take a few minutes. It looks like about 13 minutes. So I'll go ahead and pause the video and I'll see you guys in a minute again. All right, guys, so that's all the ROMs I want to transfer over. So let's go ahead and eject the SD card, and we'll put it into the PowKitty Q90 and see how it looks now. Okay, guys, now that we've went ahead and put our custom firmware on our SD cards, go ahead and plug it back in the bottom, and go ahead and swipe up on the power button. If everything's loaded, you should see this custom splash screen, and then you should see another one that goes PowKitty with the Game Boy. So let's go ahead and get out of here. Uh, the first thing it's going to bring you into is your power off menu because that's the last thing I did. Uh, if you go ahead and go between the shoulder buttons, it'll go through your menu. So these are games that are built into the software. And then these are your emulators. First things first, let's go ahead and change this theme. It's a little bit annoying to navigate. So let's go ahead and go to skins. I'm going to change mine to comic book. Hit start to apply. And now you can see everything is a little bit easier to navigate. It's not taking up half of the screen anymore. So let's go ahead and swap till we see our emulators, which are right here. And as you notice, we actually do have a couple Game Boy emulators. This one's the Game Boy Soul emulator. This one's Game Boy Color slash Game Boy emulator. This is another Game Boy emulator, which I believe this one's standard Gambate. While this one's Gambate uh, Soul. And then you have Game Boy Advance uh, GPSP Rumble. So it does support the rumble motor that is in here. So first things first, I wouldn't recommend this one as much. It, it claims to support rumble, but uh, I don't think any Game Boy Color or Game Boy games do that. So not a big deal. For me personally, I'm just gonna go ahead and remove it. And you can remove it by hitting the select button and then hitting delete GB rumble. In fact, even though you've deleted ROM folders that you didn't want on your device, the emulators will still show up. And all I have to do is hit select, go to the emulator, and then hit yes, you like you want to delete, and now it's go and now it's gone. So let's go ahead and try out our Game Boy Color emulator. So as you can see, uh, right now I think it's applied to the cotton candy colorization theme, so that's something that we couldn't do before. So let's go ahead and hit the minus button. And one thing I will say about these menus is that they're reversed, so B is A and A is B. And you might actually have to swap it in the settings too. So just make sure that in your input settings, button A is button A and button B is button B. Unfortunately though, that will not swap it in the menu. So let's go ahead and go to video settings. And we can choose our mono palette. So we can even go to, let's say, 18-bit PAL. We can hit apply and save. Sorry, and back to game. And this is how it would look like if you had it on a Game Boy. So let's go ahead and go back into video settings and we'll choose one more palette. All 
And there you go. So now you have a fully functional Game Boy and Game Boy Color emulator that does do full colorization for your Game Boy games. And everything does work here just fine. I've seen no sound distortions, no real issues with screen tearing. Everything is all good here. As we can see by Game Boy Color, the first time you launch it, it's going to have this Game Boy Color mask around it. I'm not a personal fan of that, so let's go ahead and change it. Let's hit the minus button. Let's go into settings. And let's go on to Game Boy Color border. I'm going to hit no border, hit back. And then we're going to go ahead and scale this to 1.6 this fast. All right, there you go. I prefer that scaling because it still keeps things sharp without smoothing out the pixels as I'm not really a huge fan of that smoothing effect on these older pixel games. So let's go ahead and press B again and press B one more time and now we can see. I mean and just look at the colors on this guy. You would never guess that this device is only $26. So let's go ahead and And then one thing I am noticing with all these Game Boy emulators um, is that for some reason A and B are swapped. So just go make sure you go into settings. And we go to input settings right here. Button layout. Let's go to alternate. All right. So the first alternate setting is going to make A, A and B, B. No idea why it's not set like that from the default. As you can see, we have perfect color reproduction and everything's nice and smooth. Now, if you go ahead and try out Game Boy Advance, you're gonna notice it's gonna have a little bit of black border right here and here, but you can barely tell just because it doesn't fully scale with it properly. So let's go ahead and click on Yoshi's Island. And as you can see, compared to the Super Nintendo from earlier, it seems to be loading quite quickly. Let's go ahead and hit start. It looks like for this Game Boy Advance emulator, the buttons being swapped is actually just fine. For some reason in the software, B is A and A is B. But then when you actually play the game, A is A and B is B. So I'm not really sure what's going on, but I just wouldn't change any settings when it comes to your inputs. Alright. And when it comes to Yoshi's Island, I am noticing a little bit of slowdown right here and a little bit of skips. So games like this that are a little bit more intense for GBA emulation, I probably wouldn't recommend doing too many of those. While Yoshi's Island may have given me some trouble on the Game Boy emulator, Super Circuit's been just fine for me. So I'm not really sure if it comes down to the ROM or comes down to the optimization of the emulator. NES works just fine, so I'm not going to go ahead and show that one. But when it comes to Super Nintendo, let's see if the custom firmware helped at all with Yoshi's Island. Alright, by default, this emulator is set to a frame skip of 4, and it doesn't really seem to be helping that much. I am afraid to say, I think when it comes to Super Nintendo, about 70% of the library might be compatible. A game like this and even the original Super Mario World is really only playable on a frame skip of 4, which still comes with a lot of sound glitches. And as you can see, the frame rate is just atrocious when you're scrolling down. Mega Drive is going to work just fine though, PC Engine will work just fine, MAME will work just fine, Final Burn Alpha. Most of the games aren't compatible with it, so I don't recommend it. Neo Geo, damn near everything is compatible with it. Wonder Swan, all good to go. There is one individual trying to make everything compatible with PlayStation 1. I will go ahead and link his stuff down in the description. Um, through a different combination of BIOSes, settings, and clock speeds, he's trying to get every game to run on this emulator. So if you go ahead and launch it, we can go ahead and see his performance. Earlier I, t I tested Rockman on here, so let's go ahead and see how it works. Uh, I believe on the original software I was getting about 45 frames a second. So far even the intro screen looks a lot better. Good. Don't buy this guy primarily for PlayStation 1 games and Super Nintendo games. Treat them as nice bonuses where approximately 70% of the catalog is going to be compatible with this guy. 
Alright, so let's go ahead and check out Rockman 8. With PlayStation 1, the custom firmware seemed to help quite a bit. On the stock firmware, I was getting about 30 to 45 frames per second. Now I'm getting a cool 60 with a couple dips to the 58s. So yeah, with PlayStation 1, I can honestly say that the custom firmware has really helped with its performance. Now that we've come to the end of the video, the only question is, would I recommend you go out right now and purchase one for yourself? The answer is a resounding yes. This guy is only $26. Again, $26, I think with shipping it ended up being like $32. And this can play thousands and thousands of games. Every single Game Boy Advance game, every single Game Boy Color game, every single NES game or Famicom game, Sega Genesis, Sega City, Sega Game Gear, does it play every single Super Nintendo game? No, it's going to play about 70% of the library. Does it play every PlayStation 1 game? No, it's probably playing more like 40 to 50% of the PlayStation 1 library. But this guy, for what it does, is a really good value. I mean, you could pick up literally an Xbox One game for $60, or you can put thousands of your own games into this for only 30 bucks shipped. Now, after today, am I going to keep playing this thing? I'm not going to lie, no. And the reason why is because I do have a little bit bigger and better one. I have the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. This guy plays every Super Nintendo game. This guy plays N64. It plays a couple GameCube games, and I can even upscale all my PSP games, or most of the PSP games, for two times in every PS1 game, basically 2x. But this guy is $100, shipped 112 to 134 and this guy is $30 shipped. So, honestly, for the price and for the value, if you're just looking for something just to play Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, like old school 16 and 8-bit games, I highly recommend the Pow Kitty Q90. Obviously, if you want something with more power, and again, three times the price, go with something like the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus or an Amber Nick device. But, that being said, that's going to be it for me today, guys. This has been Adam with Adam Tech. I do try to make videos every week. So if you do like what you see, go ahead, like, and subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next one.